All right, good evening to you. It's uh, six o'clock uh, Perth time and I believe eight o'clock in Eastern States. So a very good evening to you and welcome to our 30 minutes educational webinar. Tonight's topic is WA. How does the residential tenancies COVID-19 Act affect you? My name is Garth Davis and I'm the founder and CEO of Property Pass. It's a pleasure to um, be here with you this evening. Um, so sometimes we get asked, uh, what does Property Powerhouse do? Well, by providing education, support and experience, Property Powerhouse enables mum and dad investors to buy properties around Australia, building up their wealth and helping them retire debt-free on their own home and creating multiple passive income streams. And following our mission of bringing you education, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker this evening. That's Jamie Horner, and she is the Director uh, of Empire Property Management. And Jamie says, how do you become a long-term successful investor that is ready for a life of relaxation? Well, it's all about your team. And Jamie has helped more than 1,500 property owners for more than 20 years acquire, build, and hold their own property empire through investor-focused property and strata management strategies. So a very warm welcome to you, Jamie, and over to you for your presentations. And there will be questions at the back end of this. So very good evening. Good evening, everyone. And Garth, thank you for having me. Um, I would like to say that um, tonight is definitely new ground. I uh, tend to do sometimes presentations that I've done before, but this is very new stuff. Um, it is we're only a week in, so I'm going to dive straight in because I love to talk. So when Garth said 15 minutes, I thought, oh, let's get an hour's worth of talking into 15. So excuse me if I go a little bit quickly. Um, as you know, um, everything with COVID is changing quickly. So we do have that disclaimer um, in the sense that even when I probably wrote or Garth and I talked about putting this session on, it was called a bill. And as of Friday afternoon, it was an act. So uh, things are constantly changing. So if we could just probably get straight into what we're here to talk about, um, it's the Residential Tenancies COVID Act uh, came into effect Friday last week. And then we also on Thursday last week got a state government residential rent relief grant. So that wasn't on our topics for discussion. However, given that's just come on board, we're going to go into that as well. Okay, so getting straight into what's happened in the last month, obviously we've all had some uh, downtime or a little bit of craziness. Something that we are not going to get into the, the nitty gritty of the legislation. However, 23rd of March was when WO went into lockdown. We definitely had a couple of, uh, a period of, a f of three weeks where owners, tenants and property managers didn't have a structure to work with. Um, I'll probably suggest that since the 17th all the way to last week, we now have an act to work with. So it's given everyone some really good guidance. But the reason I've got the coloured dial from yellow to red on the side of it is, is because between that 23rd of March to almost last week, when owners, tenants uh, don't have guidance or property managers as to what legislation they should look to, what a rent agreement is or what hardship is, it does create uneasiness. So great news, as of last Friday, we currently had law. And just to let you know, even though it only became law last Friday, you'll see at the bottom of my email that this bill has an, is called an emergent, has an emergency period. And that runs from the 30th of March all the way to the 1st of October. So anything that you have done with your tenancy, even uh, something that you might've done months ago, which is renew their lease at a higher rate, all of those sort of things still come into effect, even though the law was passed last Friday. Moving on to the next slide that we've got in relation to the rent relief. So the WA State Government, last Thursday announced a rent relief program. Now, in relation to this rent relief program, it's the first place we wanna send our tenants in hardship. Um, the reason is, is that hardship is not well defined. So if you're asking an owner or a property manager to decide if your tenant is in hardship, 
it's going to be a little bit subjective. Um, you can't ask for bank statements, you can't ask for a few other things. So the first step that we are sending our tenants to is to the state government. Um, you can see that they've we've simplified here what you'd be required to do, but the Department of Commerce website has very clear guidelines. So the first thing that we're asking tenants to do is, is we're sending them a hardship form if they are falling into rent arrears or they are saying that they're going to. And now we're sending them to the state government's website, which is Department of Commerce. Now, we're asking them to make sure that they meet this criteria, which is lost their job on or after March 20th, have applied for Centrelink income support, have less than 10,000 of household savings. Now, this is not up for us to decide. Um, you'll find that Demers or Department of Commerce, as it's better known, will actually make these assertions. So your tenant will lodge this information. And then we've also got the point that where the rent has to at least be 25% of their total household income. So if they've got a large total household income and the rents are less than 25% of what they need to pay, then they're also not going to qualify. The very last point that I've highlighted here in green is that if the tenant meets all of this, they only get up to a maximum of $2,000 or four weeks rent. So if your tenants are paying the average rent in Perth, which is about $350 per week, they're only going to get four weeks at $350. They're not going to get the $2,000. They have to have had a rent reduction agreement in place with you. So at the moment, given this is new legislation, it's a little bit hard to offer the tenant the rent reduction without knowing that they fall and meet the other steps. So what we're asking the tenants to do is inquire, see if they meet the steps. And if they do meet the steps, then we will look to go into um, a rent reduction period for them over the next four weeks. Switching through to the next slide that we've got, Garth. Okay, so the actual state government residential relief is a totally different concept to what we've got here, which is the residential tenancies bill. Like I said, it commenced on the 30th of March. So we're going backwards and we're going all the way to the 30th of September and it's called an emergency period. So some key legislation that you need to know is that rent cannot be increased. So it doesn't matter if in January you signed a new extension of your tenant's lease in, in April or May or June, and it was going up, it can't go up. So as an example, um, our office probably right now in April is looking at leases in July, which means in January, we were doing Aprils. Um, I can also guarantee you that with the way the Perth market was, that there were probably a few rent increases in there. We've had to now go back uh, retrospectively, have a look at any lease that was ending between 1 April all the way to 30th of September and that tenant's rent increase can no longer happen during that period and it's been put off to occur on the 1st of October. So a lot of owners are asking me, can I still put the rent up? Yes, we're if the rent was due to go up and the market was showing it, we're putting it up, but we're obviously letting the tenants know that that actual increase won't come into effect until the 1st of October. Number two, no break lease fees. So a tenant in hardship, and I'm going to stress hardship because when this uh, legislation originally went through the houses, there was no hardship put in place. REWA lobbied extremely hard uh, over the night that it passed through the two houses and actually managed to get hardship in there. So a tenant can break lease provided they are in hardship. Now, Again, subjective as to how you establish hardship, but they can provide 21 days notice and have no break lease fees. So just like their lease was coming up, 21 days notice and you can't charge them letting fees, advertising, final bond inspections, those sort of things. Now, as an owner, you cannot terminate a lease during the emergency period. So last week we had an owner that decided he wanted his property back during this period. Unless the owner can show hardship, mutual agreement, so they come to an agreement with the tenant or there's some abandonment or damage or a few other things in play, you can't have your property back, which means that the tenant can continue on and you either need to renew or continue periodic. Now, I've highlighted the word renew in there because some owners have said, well, I'll just continue periodic until the end of the emergency period. 
I have a feeling that a lot of things are going to come up at the end of this emergency period and I don't think a lease is necessarily what you want and I've never liked leases also coming up in December. So my point to owners is if you can't terminate the tenant during this period and you can't come to a mutual agreement because you need your property back, renew the lease. Um, if the rent was due to go up, renew it at a higher rent. Also too, if you are going to renew that lease, I don't necessarily think I would have it being a six month lease coming up in October and November. I would really probably try to push that lease to at least be an eight, nine, and if you can, 12 month lease. Um, I'm not saying that lots of movement will happen October and November, but when we fall out of this act or this emergency period, we could see movement. So it's better to probably have your tenant locked in. You can at least start seeing rent increases if, if you had factored one in also around that October period. Next point, you are not required to maintain or repair unless it's an urgent repair or an essential service. Um, I could definitely let you know though that if you are in a position where you can continue to maintain the property or repair it, please do. Um, in the same way, when we are having tenants ask us for rent uh, reductions when they're not falling under any COVID circumstances, tenants will be extremely upset if they're continuing to pay rent, but you're not continuing to maintain the property. However, if you are in hardship and you can't, there is some parameters, but beware, um, it probably won't go down well with your tenant if you stop doing maintenance items. Um, you also don't have a choice when it comes to urgent or essential services. The next two, you're probably thinking, well, are they really that important? And they are to a property manager. So no rent default notices. Now, you're probably thinking, is it really that bad? It sort of is because a breach in a termination notice is an official document that we can issue that says, hey, your rent is late, pay attention to it, or you might be terminated. When you start removing the ability to send default notices like breach or terminations, you're back to probably sending email reminders, phone calls, those sort of things, text reminders. They don't have the same uh, capacity to probably push your tenant to make payment. So that's one of the things that is probably going to come out of this, that if your tenant does fall behind, all the measures that we would normally put in place have sort of been taken away from us. You can, however, breach your tenant or terminate them if they have failed on a rent agreement. Um, I'll fall later into that on to how we would establish that. But the next step also is, is that usually we breach, we terminate, we apply to court, and then you've got that fact that we can put them on a defaulting tenancy database. That is the last item that has actually been taken away out of our power. So we can't list a tenant on a defaulting database. So they're the things that we sort of need to think about. One, renew that lease if you want to, or you can, um, and it's, it should continue on. Put a rent increase in place if it should be put in place. Just be aware that you can't start taking that higher rent until October. Um, if a tenant does establish hardship, um, obviously the first step would be see if that state government rent relief works for them. If not, break lease might be the next option. Um, Garth, I'll get you to switch me to the next screen. Okay, so what the grant and the bill means to you. Something that the state government has been very, very good on in the last two weeks is letting people know that it is not a moratorium on rent. Um, we obviously had federal government announcements talking about a, a six month moratorium, which created a lot of rent strike groups. Um, it was cleared up luckily a few weeks later that it does not mean that you can stop paying rent. So anything that you stop paying you owe at the end of the emergency period now let's not let's hope that no tenant owes you six months rent at the end of the emergency period because the chances of you getting payment of six months rent at the edge end of the emergency period would be low what it is a six month moratorium on is evictions so you may have to carry a six month debt but we're going to talk about the ways that you can avoid that so first thing is get the tenant to establish if they qualify for the WA State Government Rent Relief Program. Like I said, Demers and Commerce or Commerce has a great website where the tenant can follow the steps and see if they qualify. If the tenant does qualify, enter into a rental payment agreement with them. Now, that agreement will be a waiver because the reason being is that if you waiver for up to four weeks, even at the full amount or even at a lower amount, 50%, Department of Commerce will actually 
pay you that amount direct if the tenant qualifies for the state government rent relief. So what we're saying is if your tenant's rent is 750 per week, you might not offer a four week waiver because you're only gonna get about $2,000 back. However, if your tenant is paying 350, 400 a week, they meet all the requirements of the state government rent relief program, then you would look to enter a payment agreement a payment agreement that is a waiver with them. So the waiver therefore means that they meet all the criteria, the tenant does not have to pay that back to you and the state government will pay it direct to you. Now, if your tenant does not meet the state government's requirements, your next option is to look to offer a deferment. I've put deferment, if not in orange, with a couple of asterisks because my point being is that if your tenant doesn't meet the rental payment agreement, do they meet hardship? Um, and I know that that might sound a bit harsh, but if you're not going to meet the rental payment agreement, can you show us in other ways that you are affected by hardship? And if you are, and you feel like there is some valid information there presented to you, then you can offer a deferment. Um, my recommendation is enter short rental payment deferral agreements. The way WA is going at the moment, the way we're moving back to schools going back, um, must admit alcohol restriction waived, joining groups of 10 people or not. If you want to enter a rental deferral agreement of eight weeks, for example, we could all be back at work. Um, our economy could be looking better. My point is, is that if you enter a short rental payment deferral agreement, something like two or four weeks would be a recommendation if you need to. The reason I'm talking two to four weeks is, is because that way it allows you to then enter another agreement later or breach or terminate because the tenant, you've got an agreement, the tenant didn't make it, now we can move to the next stage. Okay, so what steps should you take? Um, I still think no matter whether your tenant is default or not, give them a call. Um, I've asked all our team to call our property, uh, our owners and our tenants, see where they're up to. A lot of owners have asked me what their tenant's job is, which I think is really important to look at. If your tenant is not in hardship, perfect. I'll say, let's skip all the way down to bottom, the bottom item in green. But if they are, it's important that they establish hardship. Next step is, is should they break lease or should they go into a, a or is a rental agreement appropriate? Um, I'm going to say that in some cases, if your tenant really can't afford to pay $5.50 per week, it doesn't matter how long you keep doing rental deferment agreements or they get the state government's grant. In about four weeks time, you're going to be back to where you were. So it might be best that you allow them to break lease because I can tell you that the market is looking good and you won't be waiting long necessarily to find another tenant. If you are going to do a rental agreement, make sure, like I said, you keep it short so that you can keep assessing as we go. You need to know how long you can afford to do a rent deferment for. So I have had some owners that said, give the tenants a few months free. Um, my point being, start with short amounts and then see how you go. Make sure you know whether you're offering a waiver or deferment. If they're getting the state government's return um, in relation to the relief, go for waiver. If not, and they're not getting the waiver, then assess whether they are still in hardship and offer a deferment. Once they have entered into that deferment uh, or that waiver, and if they stop paying, you can breach or you can make a decision to say, well, their jobs are coming back to them or something's happening, I'll give them another short-term deferment. If you can't meet any of the above, and I must admit there are tenants who are just, no, give me a four week reduction for us, three months, four months, you have to show that you offered something. So offer something, offer a waiver, offer a deferment. And if they deny that, don't communicate with you, then you go into the conciliation process. Um, next step is protect yourself with alternate measures. Generally, um, for our owners, we have a few alternate measures. If, for example, you know, tenant doesn't pay, we breach, we terminate, we go to court, we look at your landlord protection insurance. Right now, breach, termination and defaulting tenancy has been taken away from us. So how do you establish alternate measures? You can't change your landlord protection insurance at the moment. I think uh, Garth and I did a webinar probably or a, or, or a video five weeks ago where you had this window of one week. So you can't change your landlord protection, but look at other things. Um, at Empire, we've got our owners on a debt collection um, 
subscription with Barclay is $66 for the full year. If you don't need it, great. But if you do need it, we can put debt collection in place. Um, and Barclay is are still offering those policies. And uh, for our empire owners, they're actually still agreeing to offer it to owners, who, the tenants who have already fallen into arrears. So we can't breach, we can't terminate, we can't apply to court, we can't put them on a de defaulting tenancy database. Our owners are putting a protective measure like debt collection as a backup in place. So those are the sort of things that you need to look at to try to protect your income. Okay, what have we got next? All done. Okay, well, well done, uh, Jamie. Um, a lot of information there, really important information. We've got uh, 10 minutes until we wind up and there have been some good questions coming through. So um, just wanted to ask some of the questions that have come through. And as you can see, Jamie, uh, very, very knowledgeable. She's been uh, been working with Jamie now for probably something like 12 years as a preferred property uh, partner, property management partner. She does a wonderful job and um, uh, personally managed one of my own properties for 10 years and did an amazing job. So she runs a really, really good team there. Right, the first question that's come in this evening is from Helen. How many tenants are actually running behind on their rent, Jamie? There's obviously we, we've got all these factors in place if something goes wrong, but is it a big problem? Is it a little problem? What's happening? On Garth, we factored in as an office 10 to 15 percent um, and I can probably tell you it is much lower than that. It's not just my office. I'd probably suggest that our rent arrears is at 3 percent and I can probably tell you that most agencies generally run at 3 percent. So um, catching up with four other licensees who also have a very big portfolio from Rockingham up to north of the river to Gosnells out to Midland, they're also got numbers under 5 percent. So it's, it's actually really not as large as we thought it would be. And to tell you the truth, 5% for most of the agencies that I deal with is actually a normal rent arrears percentage. Um, as an office, ours is under 1%, so going up to three is a bit high, but that's nothing compared to the 10 or 15 that we were predicting. Fantastic. Um, we did have one question asking if the slides would be shared. So yes, after this event, we will be sending a um, recording of the webinar. And also, uh, Jamie's kindly um, allowed us to share her slides um, as a PDF. So those will be coming uh, this evening. Uh, second question that's come through, this has come through from Mark. Are you seeing different trends between tenants uh, that are paying affordable rents around, or relative affordable rents, let's say the three, $300 per week mark, versus tenants that are paying rents, let's say the six or $700 per week mark. So um, although they, they um, they're in different um, dollar terms per week. Are you seeing different patterns of how tenants are behaving or, or um, not being able to pay their rent um, out there, Jamie? I definitely think that is too different. Um, like I said, one of the licensees I work with has a very large portfolio in the more affordable rent range and they are seeing very minimal changes. Um, interestingly enough, it's more your rent sometimes around that 500 to 700 per week where that's a large amount of money. So when that income stops, it's it's a big pull. So yes, we are seeing that sometimes at the higher mark, we are needing to allow that break lease. But I'd say 99% of those more affordable properties, especially with the stimuluses that are in place, you know, they got a 750 a few weeks ago, um, another 750 coming. We have definitely not seen them. I think we're in an era where there is quite an, a large amount of stimulus available to people. Excellent. A question here from Gillian, and um, there are some questions coming through which are live, but I'm just going through the ones that were pre, uh, pre sent through. So Gillian is asking, um, are you finding, Jamie, that a lot of landlords are having to sell their properties in this market? No. So I think probably in the last two weeks, the girls emailed me through saying, oh, this one is selling and the sales rep has got in contact with us. And I must admit, we all sort of thought, oh, that's an interesting time to sell. I can actually tell you that that property is already under offer. It probably only went up to market two weeks ago and it's gone under offer. So we've had one. And Jamie, that's one out of, okay, so you had one. Land. One out of 500, 550, yeah. Okay, so again, like what we're saying is, although we've got a provision for tenants that are not going to pay the rent, you're having very minimal numbers, having issues. Um, any worry of tenants, of landlords having to exit the market. So people 
worried that the landlords are going to all be jumping out of the market. You've had one out of 500 go on the market. So I think it's really important that we stay uh, relative with what's actually happening on the market. Obviously, all these things are affected in worst case scenarios, but so far, tenants seem to be paying rent. Landlords are hanging in, um, which is fantastic. Um, I got a, this is um, this is a bit of a question from us. This comes from Gary, who's based overseas but has a property here in Perth. Um, his uh, tenant's lease is expiring in May, so next month. My tenant has indicated they cannot afford the rent anymore. We cannot reach a sensible new rental agreement. They are after twenty five percent discount for well twelve months, nothing less. So they have decided to vacate. With WA going back to school and work imminently, do you think the market, rental market will hold up or that landlords are going to have to heavily discount to maintain tenants in their properties? No discounting, Garth. The, the one thing that COVID is hiding is the fact that uh, we had a very buoyant, almost rent increasing kind of market. Um, if you look at, if anyone wants to Google, you know, Rewa's uh, stats on leasing, three years ago, there was a 58 day gap between finding a tenant. The good agencies are doing it in seven to 14 days in all areas. So uh, you need about 6,500 rental properties for there to be equilibrium. I think when we entered Corona or even when I caught up with you to do a presentation a month ago, there was 6,000. We're down to 5,200. There's not enough rental stock. We probably have seven properties available on our rental list we usually have 25 next month we probably will have five that's it's it's uh it's tenants may want to break lease but i think you'll find that there's not enough there's not enough stock it's we're still definitely in an owner's market and the good agents in perth if you have a look at them on uh, re was uh best 30 which were announced last about last week average even in rockingham gosnells midland northern suburbs even less is 14 days between getting yeah okay next question comes from travis uh what should a rent relief agreement look like and is there uh, available and could we share one with him uh i must admit from uh when this all started until uh the act came out last week we we're all trying to do our own but rewa has been kind enough to give us two agreements so uh happy to share those one's a waiver and one is uh i think i've got them here one's a waiver one's a deferral so garth if i send those through to you um if anyone would like a copy of them you know more than happy to have them shared okay we're 27 past we've got a couple of questions that have come live so i'm going to ask uh, go through those this one's from Murray. If a tenant is on a periodic, if you sell the property, can the tenant be asked to leave by the new owners? No. Mm. Until so, the end of the emergency period. So we're looking at now it also too depends on if the tenant's already been issued a termination notice. If the tenant was issued a termination notice prior to 30th of March, not a problem. But if you want to try to terminate or sell, no. Even the new act requires a bank mortgagee, even if they close in to honour the lease. So, uh, or the tenancy all the way to the 1st of October. So even banks under the new act are not allowed to repossess a property. Uh, they've always had the ability, so, so no. Uh, mutual agreement is the best way. If not, you're waiting till 1 October. Okay. Uh, the second question comes from uh, Russell. Uh, so next question, um, there's been some talk of property prices dropping, I won't dis discuss that now, but uh, we don't see that happening in, in Perth or in the Brisbane, the two markets we're concentrating on, but his question is around, are you expecting to see a drop, uh, a big drop in the rental market of rents? No, look, I hate to say the uh, six month no rent increase is a bit of a tough one, our Perth owners were, were getting those. Um, all we're doing is deferring that pain. I, I hate to say that, you know, when you look at our rental numbers, we have not, we do not have enough stock. We have a constant demand and we have a low supply, which means that by the time we get out of this emergency period, unless people are buying properties, uh, we're going to have a problem with not enough supply and hence, hence more rent increases. All right, we 29 past, so we're just going to wind up. There were some other questions there. I will uh, reply to those questions offline. So 
Uh, thank you. Also, I wanted to um, just let you know that we do have quite a few clients that also have Queensland-based properties, so Brisbane and Gold Coast. I just want to let you know regarding that, we'll be covering uh, questions on the Queensland Tenancy Act, and we'll be running a very similar to webinar like this. It's a free 30-minute webinar. That will be next Thursday, the 7th of May, again at this time, which is 6 to 6.30 per time and 8 to 8.30 Eastern States time. Uh, invites will be emailed out in the next couple of days, so please register for that event. Um, also in closing, uh, please, we'd be, uh, we'd be very happy if you would like our Property Powerhouse Facebook page, our LinkedIn page, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn on the post to keep update with all our coming education and educational events and information. So we, as we've said to you earlier, education is really important to us. We want to educate yourselves um, as investors. Um, so an opportunity coming up to discuss if you have a property in Brisbane. Um, just to remind you that this evening again, we will be emailing out a recording of this webinar along with the slides and that template, the rent relief, relief agreement template. Um, those will be coming out to you tonight. And we wanted to say a very special thank you again to our guest presenter this evening, Jamie Horner. Thank you so much um, from a director of Empire State Property Management. And um, thank you very much to all our attendees. Um, have a great evening. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs>